Everyone is suffering, everyone is depressed. If you look at the eyes of the people, you see empty eyes, sad faces. Always we must apologize that we won the war. Since then, five wars. Isn't it enough? It's enough. The Israeli side don't care about the Palestinians, whether they die or not. They don't care. 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 I believe that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Every Israeli, Every wants, Israeli peace. wants peace. And what divides us is how to go about getting it. I imagine the Jewish person like a monster because he have my land, he have my own. So I didn't like him, I hate him, hate him, hate him. And uh, it's very simple to say that they hate Jews and that therefore they kill Jews. Some of my friends were killed by Hamas, were murdered by Hamas. If I don't have a Palestinian state, if my fellow Palestinians don't have passports, there will never be peace in the Middle East. Peace in the Middle East. Israelis and Palestinians remain locked in a bitter struggle for mutual peace and security. In January of 1998, a group of Jewish Americans traveled to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza with the Compassionate Listening Project. This project invites North Americans to play a more active role in Israeli-Palestinian reconciliation. We as American Jews have the unique opportunity to be trusted by both sides here. And I saw the potential for American Jews to play a much greater role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. American Jews care very, very deeply about what's going on here. And most of them have very little access to the actual people on the ground who are involved in this conflict. Listening is very, very key in, in Jewish liturgy, to really, really be silent so that we can hear. Is that the folk saying, when you open your mouth, you're closing your ears. So the Compassionate Listening Project is, uh, has a direct link to a, a Jewish spiritual practice, which is not always to speak, but to take time in our davening, in our prayer life, to know that there's a time to speak and there's a time to listen. In other words, after we do our prayers, it's the time to really maybe sit down and be silent and receive what is the message. That it has to do with listening. Mostly what people need, in whatever way they get it, is to be heard. And hearing somebody, listening to somebody, and them knowing they're being listened to, really, really does create change. You know, we think of something monumental has to happen for change. And in reality, I think it can be as simple as just being heard. The most important concept Judaism has about human beings, and it's a very radical concept, is that every human being is made in the divine image. And that, for me, is the basis of Jewish peacemaking, to see the face of God in every other human being, no matter who. And uh, that means for the peacemaker not taking sides and talking to people who may believe things or do things that you think are terrible. That's probably one of the biggest roadblocks to listening to someone who disagrees with you is that it almost, I mean, we almost tell ourselves, well, if I listen, I'm agreeing. It means that person's going to think that I agree with them. That isn't what this is about. We don't necessarily agree. They, we're not asking people in this group to give up their points of view. It's listening and respecting someone else whose point of view is being valid. Every human being on this planet has a piece of the answer or a piece of the puzzle. And if we don't listen to people who disagree with us, we're never going to find the answers. The, the wholeness is the answer. I had some fears about coming on this trip. Um, I think I absorbed some of the attitudes of my friends who certainly see the headlines and see the West Bank and see incidents of terror and see people waving guns on, on television and think that nobody in his right mind would go to such a place. I can't tell you why I feel this way, but when I hear the Muazzin call people to prayer, I feel completely intoxicated. La 
how perfectly cool for a whole hillside to be saying, God is great, God is great. At the heart of it is a witnessing and acknowledging a gratefulness, and I, I turn my heart in that direction. Last night, you know, I, I came here, and we were, st we were staying in this beautiful place, and I kept thinking, there's something about this place. I don't know what it is. And in the middle of the night, I woke up at 3 a.m., and I thought, pilgrims stay here. And that this work is part of my pilgrim's path, the work of this group and this trip. As I come soon to meet people whose backgrounds are very different than mine, I hope that I'm able to listen not just to their words, but to their souls. We think that we've been dealt a very severe injustice as Palestinians. Now, certainly this came about in the context of also a terrible persecution of the Jewish people in Europe and other places. And so when things came to be as they are, I couldn't, uh, I, uh, for one, I couldn't uh, see that, uh, uh, that the injustice dealt to the Palestinians should uh, make me close my eyes about the injustice that happened to the Jewish people huh. and that brought about the situation as it is. That's why I've been able to prevail on my feelings and see that there is no way but to accept a Jewish presence in, in, in Palestine. But that the, 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 the Jewish people come to the situation to ignore my basic rights, this is absolutely intolerable. On the 30th of November, 1947, they start shooting and they start killing us. Always we must apologize that we won the war since then, five wars. I was in all those wars. Isn't it enough? Why it, it has to be my concern, only my concern, because they lost the war, so I have to give them a solution? Why not the Arab countries? Why don't they absorb them? I want to leave also, I want to survive. Sometimes I wish that it was a dream, and I woke up and I find myself still in my home, still live in that area. It's a very beautiful area, you know, it's Latrun. It's mountains, olives and uh, trees, uh, water, and I have my home there. So why there pick me out from my home and throw me out? I don't understand this till now. I am a human, I am a person. They can have the land, but they, they, they didn't have to, to... to do that with me. As they dreamed for a for million years that this is their home, and this is my home too. In the last hundred years, both of us, both sides, have committed atrocities, have deeply wronged the other, have violated the other's basic sense of self, trampled on our deepest sensitivities and sense of justice and of our own history. We're guilty and you're guilty. I believe that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. I couldn't possibly believe otherwise because this is what 2,000 years of longing have conditioned in me. I'm part of the generation that won back these lands after thousands of years of longing. 
And for me to be the same generation that has to give it up is an almost unbearable psychic leap. Nevertheless, to end this conflict, I'm willing to put everything on the table. If I don't have a Palestinian state, if my fellow Palestinians don't have passports, everywhere they are, and they feel that they have a national identity, a place where they can belong to, there will never be peace in the Middle East. And this is our message to the Israelis. A Palestinian state is in the best interest of Israel. They want us to condemn terror, okay. But I still want Israelis to come outside and stand up and say, we support the Palestinian state. The Palestinians deserve to have a state next to, to, to Israel, not to replace Israel. Every Israeli wants peace. Nobody wants their sons, you know, going to the army or their daughters getting blown up on Ben Yehuda, for that matter. Um, and what divides us is how to go about getting it. The whole idea of land for peace is trading a tangible for an intangible. You can see the land, you can say this border, this hill. The peace is an intangible idea. Now, if we give over the land, which is the asset that we have that they want, before they give us the peace, the relationship that we want, they have no more incentive anymore to give us the peace. They've got what they wanted. If you are aware in our position, you will not accept any occupation and you will resist it. This is our vision. But the Israeli side, they want everything, land, security, and they don't care about the Palestinians, whether they die or not. They don't care. And if my brother took my house and uh, deported me from it, uh, which is my brother from my father and my mother, I will fight him until I get back my house. And our enemies in this neighborhood have real, legitimate grievances against us. They didn't make them up. And we, we don't have to be paranoid to be afraid of them because we have objective historical reasons to be afraid of them because they want to get even. They are enraged against us for taking their land and uh, displacing them and then not acknowledging their loss, their grief, their pain. All my visits to Israel have been uh, basically afraid to be in Hebron. So last night to be in homes of people uh, where we were able to communicate uh, both uh, uh, ideas, understandings, but just human feelings of warmth was extraordinary. I stayed with a family uh, uh, outside of Hebron, uh, a family of farmers, and there was so much uh, mutual love and strength they were wonderful people, and uh, really among the most generous, sweet people I've ever met. I, I even said to them as, as I left, I said, if anybody wanted to see what real hospitality is supposed to be, they should come and visit Palestinians. And we like the people who come here. We feel they are, you know, they talk in the, uh, with their hearts to us. So it's... Uh, an interesting thing to me to listen and to, to listen to them and to talk to them when they meet us, live with us, stay with us, and sleep in our homes. I think they uh, know the situation as 
really it is. The thing that just clutched at me was at dinner uh, the last evening when somehow we'd been talking about uh, the future and about his children. And he said that uh, his 11-year-old son, Orwa, had told him that he did not have any hope that there would be peace in his lifetime. And the shock of a young child looking at his future and not seeing any promise for himself. They, uh, you can uh, feel the sadness, although they are children, but they are not innocent. Even the youngest, sometimes they sigh, they uh, talk in uh, their sleep, they cry. We don't know why, but you know, this is, oh, I think the situation uh, affects them very much. Everyone is suffering, everyone is depressed. You can look, uh, if you look at the eyes of the people, you see empty eyes, um, sad faces. This is how I stay in relationship with this whole struggle here. And I do this as a Jew and with my sense of pride as a Jew and my identity as a Jew, I can feel a greater sense of my own Jewishness by embracing this Palestinian family as my family as well. For the second Shabbat of our trip, we went to one of the settlements on the West Bank called the Frat. So we arrived in Efrat just before the beginning of Sabbath. And there's sort of a frenzy about getting ready for Sabbath. I mean, sometimes no matter how much you plan during the week and think that you have everything ready, at the very end, there are always 20 things that you forgot. And you have this boundary, because once it's Shabbat, you have to let go of a lot of the weekly, worldly kinds of activities that keep you from experiencing Shabbat. So whatever it is you're doing, the last minute cooking, the last minute getting your children ready, gets speeded up as you approach Shabbat. And then all of a sudden, it's here. I was more concerned about visiting the settlements than about visiting the Palestinians in certain ways, because I've been a vocal critic of the settlement movement in the past. But the Shabbat and Efrat blew away all my stereotypes. I have to admit that I, I guess I had a stereotype, and that stereotype has been uh, shattered. It's a wonderful Jewish community. Something happened with me there that uh, hasn't happened with me in a long time in, ter in terms of my own spirituality. The reason that uh, my husband and I chose to live here and to raise our seven children here is because we feel very strongly that Jews have a right to be here and that is part of our heritage, both historically and religiously, and we think it's pretty cool that after 2,000 years, the Jews made it back home. But more than anything, we want to be able to live here in peace with our neighbors, with all our neighbors, and that's a point that needs to be gotten across. We're not a group of people that love land more than lives, those of us, the Jews who live in Judea and Samaria. We feel that we're not obstacles to peace. We feel that we're indicators of peace. If we can live here in peace and security with our neighbors, and that, that's indicative of a greater peace and res mutual respect among the people in the region. And so I would like to see a situation whereby I don't have to have guards in front of my children's kindergarten anymore because I know that nobody's going to try and come in and you know terrorize them in any way. And, uh, or you know, plastic windows on my car because of Molotov cocktails that are thrown at me as I'm driving. So I would like to see the, the basic element of security. It seems like we harp on it a lot, but it is such a basic element. It's, it's got to be one of the building blocks. Since 
1986, there is suddenly a dramatic redu uh, reduction of permission for building homes. And there is the principle that says that you cannot make a law or regulations that people cannot stand in. You cannot ask the Palestinians since 86, now you don't uh, marry, you don't bring <laughs> children, you don't build homes, simply like this. <laughs> Impossible. They must break the law. Eight years ago, there was estimation of 13,000 houses that were built without permission. The house demolitions usually come where they want to expand settlements or when they want to build bypass roads, which is purely against any chance for peace. We're in the middle of this incredibly expansive and beautiful landscape that's so ancient and it's very sparse. And in this home are several families gathered together to talk to us. And this strange kind of peacefulness in the midst of telling us horrendous stories about what they're experiencing. Being able to build homes, being able to get permits, being able to go to work without facing harassment. And one woman in particular, I, you know, reached across to her and took her picture and we hugged. And um, she's right there behind you. <laughs> and it's very moving to look at her because she looks like my aunt, my mother's aunt. So she invited me to, to see her home, even though she couldn't speak any English and I spoke one word of Arabic. She took me to her home and I could really feel her tremendous sorrow and sense of instability that she didn't know whether her home would be would stay because it may it might be demolished. It's one of the homes that is slated for demolition. You know of course it was very painful to see this. I don't really want to believe that that's going on. I just don't want to believe that that my people, my, my Jewish people, would be involved in, in inhumane policies, and I'm having a lot of trouble with that right now. I must say that uh, for me, the whole question of homeless uh, people is a very disturbing uh, issue. It's something that I cannot somehow accept. And here people have homes. They live in home. They did nothing bad to no one. And one day, their home is gone and they left without. It is a human issue. People that have homes, look, they have homes. They did everything they could in their life to save money, to, 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 to build this home. And then it's gone. Why? And I tell you just one story. One day in 1956, when Israel occupied Gaza at, at the time of the Suez War, I had the chance to see the first Jew in my life. I, I was playing in the garden when the, the, the gate, you know, bell rang and, and I went to open it and there was this man asking for my father. And he said, it is, tell him that it is Moshe. He was in, in civilian clothes, he was not a soldier. All what I knew of Israelis were soldiers. And I ran that to, to my father and said, somebody called Moshe, what did you? He said, Moshe, who's Moshe? So they came and they looked at each other and then suddenly they jumped at each other, kissing and hugging. And I was uh, in a state. What is it, my father kissing a Jew? It's, it's impossible for me. So they sat, they, 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 they sat down and started to talk to each other. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't wait. I said to this man, are you a Jew? I said, yes. And I was shocked. I said, you, you must have killed Palestinians. He said, no, 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 I, I am a Palestinian too. I lived all my life in Palestine. Your father and me are like brothers. I said, what is this? I mean, there, there could be Jews who are brothers to us. That was the first, uh, and, and, uh, first, first time I saw a Jew. And then it, I think it has affected me in the sense that every time I see a soldier even, I think there is a human being there. Mm-hmm.
I uh, sincerely believe in the uh, matter of coexistence between Palestinians and Jews on an equitable basis. I am very convinced about this. When I was a little child in the middle 20s, my father was a custodian of Muslim property in Hebron. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was aware when the Jewish rabbi used to come and visit my father there. And I knew the Jewish community that lived in Hebron at that time. And I thought that uh, there was a real coexistence uh, that's going on between Jews and uh, Palestinians in, in Hebron. And actually, we lived in a flat, and the opposite flat was inhabited by a Jewish family. And every Saturday morning, the lady in the Jewish family would come and knock at our door and call me by name to go and put off the kerosene lamps in the, <laughs> in the Jewish flat. I, I mean, I remember uh, uh, vividly all, all, all these things. I wish that uh, Jewish people can open their eyes and see how much injustice and humiliation we are going through at the hands of the Israelis. <laughs> Some of my friends were killed by Hamas, were murdered by Hamas. I don't want to apologize the murders of Hamas. But if we want to try to solve the problem, we have to try we we have to try to understand the logic after this madness. And uh, it's very simple to say that they hate Jews and that therefore they kill Jews. But uh, the logic after this murderous madness is that they want to demonstrate that without us there is no solution. If we want to come to peace here in the Holy Land, we have to take into account the religious factor. Religion is much stronger than you have the impression. Peace, shalom, is Islam. <laughs> there is no other peace. Islam is shalom. The, is the, Islam is from the root of shalom, of salam. Yes? We and the Muslims have, let's say, a strong basis for solution. Now I feel absolutely shattered. There is no answer that I have, but I have many answers, and it's like a puzzle. I came here clearly as a political centrist, uh, as a very, very strong uh, Zionist, recognizing the pain of Palestinian people, but not really res recognizing Palestinians as a people. Really, there is a Palestinian state. It is a de facto state. It's existing right now, even uh, though intellectually, uh, my own mindset, I was not seeing the Palestinian state. It's existing. It, it may not have come to treaty yet. Eretz Yisrael is a very holy concept to me. There is a land that God has promised our people. I think what God forgot to tell us is that he also promised it to another people. And that the job of the children of Abraham is to both realize that this is the promised land for our people and to be able to figure out how to do the contract negotiations so we can have two states on one land. Do you know that we're sharing the city right now? We're living in the old city of Jerusalem right now. There's Christians, Arabs, and Jews. There's people from every continent in this city right now. But none of us would say we're living in the time of peace. None of us would say we're living in the time of the Messiah. But do you know what's the difference between this time and that time? 
It's all in our minds. We are sharing this city right now. If we could make room for each other in our prayers and in our dreams, this city, this moment would be the Messianic Age. The process of compassionate listening as I experienced it here was very powerful. And it's a, it's a hard thing to do because we all, you hear something that <laughs> connects with you and you want to respond to it. I have no way. And to hold back from responding and just being willing to listen some more enables the person who's talking to open up even more. I've seen amazing things happen on this trip. But I've had experiences in these last couple of weeks that have affected me so deeply. And I think that what I have heard has changed my life. When we can dispossess ourselves of a feeling about who our enemies are, and when we can be possessed by the love which will surround us in this new state, um, then, then I know that this will be a, a messianic land uh, of the kind that our ancestors could dream for. Uh, and it will be messianic because it will be beyond the vision that any of us have ever had because it really will be a land that will bloom in peace, where the voices of little children will be heard, speaking many languages together, and where no one will have to be afraid. My hope is that God should bless the Jewish people and the Palestinians to not come up with simple answers, to keep dialoguing, keep talking, and keep listening left, right, secular, religious, political, spiritual, all part of one home. That's my hope, that we could see it as one home.